Welcome to The Secure CIO, the podcast for technology executives who are tasked with hiring and retaining great cybersecurity leaders. Join best-selling author Claire Pales together with industry thought leaders as they answer your questions about sourcing the right leaders, building cybersecurity teams, candidate selection, salaries, skills, and more. Hello, I'm Claire Pales and welcome to The Secure CIO podcast. Today's guest is Sam McLeod. Sam, it's great to have you on the podcast again. Thanks, Claire. It's good to be here. Thanks for having me. We haven't caught up with you since season one. And today I wanted to talk to you about the really important topic of security operating models. So let's kick off with a really easy question. How do you define security operating models? Oh, okay. Let's start with an easy question. <laughs> Look, I, I guess for me it's the, the hub of how security will operate for the organisation. So I see an, an operating model being the culmination of skill, capability and function. It's the, the component that will help drive a security team to, to operational excellence. And within that sits the org structure and its people, which I think we'll talk a little bit about later. But it's really about how you uh, operate security, what security you'll be responsible for or capable of, uh, and sets out the why for, for the security team. It, it's, I think it's influenced by the strategy and a security reference architecture as well as business design and business capability. There's regulatory expectations in there as well. And I think it also includes how you deliver that capability, including whether or not it's insourced or, or outsourced, for example. And so you mentioned about strategy. So tell me why it's really important to anchor your operating model to an endorsed strategy. A strategy with an operating model supporting it is a strong way to position cybersecurity in the organisation. A list of operational tasks to achieve or some sort of objectives for the year or just working on audit items and things like that aren't enough to drive the right operating model or anchor it in your business. There needs to be that clear strategy that gives you the direction, the plan and the why and then the operating model on, on how you're going to deliver it. And I think it's an important overall strategic approach to information security. Gets you out of thinking just about deploying technologies and actually gets you considering functions and capabilities and people and even where outside of security you may be able to get some help to deliver the right security and risk management outcomes because it can help you identify some interconnectedness across the organisation which will help you better manage um, the condition of cyber. I think that's a really good point about the fact that security actually is more than just the security team and you know it's it's interesting how many people see operating models simply as kind of rejigging your org chart, but in fact, your security org chart is is just one component of, of how security needs to operate in your business. And I mean, why is it that people see org charts as operating models? And, and what do you think is the risk of that point of view? I think an org chart you know, in its very simplistic view is a HR requirement for identifying reporting lines and where you sit in an organisation and to have some sort of, you know, home team that you belong to. It doesn't tell you what security functions exist or how they're going to be delivered. Uh, it doesn't talk to the capability of the team or what the team needs to deliver by way of capability. And it doesn't talk to the skills required or the responsibilities that the function is going to take on. An op model, conversely, is all about overall governance of security and how you're going to meet the obligations of the, the organisation, whether that be, you know, technology risk-based or security controls-based for your audit teams or how you're going to make the strategy for your executive. So I think that the org structure is an excellent mechanism for providing roles and named resources that will tell you who's going to act out certain things from a skills-based perspective uh, and the position descriptions then help support that. But those position descriptions need to underpin what you've defined in your operating model around your security capabilities, your resource allocations. And I guess for me, the op model is more about helping the head of or, or the CISO to manage the premise that security needs of an organisation are always going to exceed the security 
capability or capacity of the team. So if you have a really good op model, it provides direction. It shows you how you're going to optimise what you deliver. Then you've got your resource allocations and then under that you've got your org structure and you've got the, the team and the skills base to show how you're actually going to deliver those outcomes. So they go hand in hand, but they're different. And it's not just about an org structure when you need to capture technology and process as well. And so if a SISO or someone in the organisation were to pull together an operating model, what, what's the minimum you would need in an operating model to make it function against the strategy? I think it varies from organisation to organisation. So I guess I can't really talk to what the bare essentials would be. It would be different for every organisation. But I think an operating model, first and foremost, needs to look at where will you drive security leadership from? How will you utilise functions or capabilities within the business and IT and the security team themselves, if you have one, to support all those security outcomes? And and even where your outsourcers or other third parties can help support the, the delivery. And I think that's the initial thinking around what an op model um, might start to look like when you're developing one in your organisation. And I think it also needs to consider the, the boundaries of the organisation you're in, the industry you're in, what regulations you've got, what do you need to uh, adhere to, what kind of maturity you're aiming for as a, a security organisation on behalf of your broader organisation, and then, you know, what kind of funding and strategy do you actually have in place? So I think... Ideally, you need to identify the critical capabilities that your organisation needs and how you're going to effectively deliver them. And that starts to kick off the intent of the operating model, whether it's a minimum viable or, or something else. Because, for example, it you know for you it might just be I need to identify and respond to external threat. And that's it. And you can develop an operating model around that and look at the function and the capability that that needs to be. And then under that, look at what kind of skills and, and people you need to drive those outcomes. Whereas, you know, for others, it might be that plus security vulnerability management, which brings in another set of thinking. So I think there's a number of building blocks that CISOs or heads of um, or even risk teams, if they're starting to look at the security capability, need to look at and think, what are those? different building blocks I need to drive security leadership across the organisation and then within a security capability or a function uh, in its own right. You know, you often hear about operating models being announced in organisations, but if they're not effectively implemented, they can fail very quickly. And I guess from your perspective, I'm interested to know what else could make an operating model fail. So not implementing it properly is, is clearly one way to make it fail, but are there other things that can be done poorly or done wrong that might also impact the success of an operating model? I think lack of engagement across the organisation. So operating models that I've designed or I've, I've helped be um, an advisor to always start with looking at the broader organisational context and talk to the risk teams and talking to the audit teams, uh, talking to the customer-facing teams, privacy, the data teams, and, and actually understanding where the ownership lies around delivering good cybersecurity outcomes. And then I think another one is around lack of ownership from the team themselves. So if you do have a cyber team, you know, when any kind of change occurs around how people are expected to operate, they can feel a little bit uncomfortable and feel like it's being done to them rather than being part of the process. So I think it's quite important to make sure that if you're working on an operating model, that the team actually get to work on that operating model as well, as well as hacking it from the perspective of a broader IT team or even an IT team plus others from the business to look at how this actually needs to hang um, within the organisation and what it looks like and how it effectively delivers. I think the other one of the other areas um, I've seen that can drive, I wouldn't necessarily call it failure, but I think a, a lack of traction is being inflexible or not having the ability to respond quickly if the operating model you've put in place isn't working. So I kind of see an operating model, you know, your strategy is one year, three year, five year, whatever it needs to be. It could be a five-minute strategy if you want. But the operating model, and that gets locked in and your funding gets approved against dirty, et cetera, whereas I think an operating model has a little bit more flex in it. It 
doesn't necessarily have to be all bitten off in one big chunk either. So it can be something that's staged and, and implemented over time. But you need to be flexible and a little bit agile by way of how you respond to something if it's not working. A really good example of that, and I'm happy to call out a, a challenge and a failure um, that I've had, was I, um, in a previous role, desperately wanted a security engineering function. I wanted to get ahead of the vulnerabilities and be testing on demand and ensure that we had end-to-end -end as well as in-between for security assessment in anything that was being developed in the organisation. And, you know, I thought I was being really innovative. I'd come up with a great idea. The team were backing me. Um, and we really wanted the IT and the other business areas to, to buy into that. And we set up a team around it. But over time, we started to realise that it just wasn't gaining traction. The stakeholders weren't necessarily getting involved and acting out what we had from a capability point of view in, in the right way. So it, it, it was failing and it was failing quick. So what I should have done instead of persisting uh, and really trying to make that capability work because I could see how successful it would be if we got it right, what I really feel I should have done is called it, got everyone in a room, pulled all the political noise into one particular channel and uh, have a conversation and bumped in early around a cross-functional team and hacked the problem to get it working properly. So I think we, we persisted too long on that one. And, and so my advice on any you know operating model and making sure that the, the failures are dealt with quickly, because there will always be some, is to revise early. It's interesting there, you've mentioned a couple of things about what to do when an operating model is wrong. And, you know, one is to kind of fail fast and get your learnings from that. And the other one is to make sure that you allow your operating model to have some flexibility in it. And yes, your, your strategy might be rigid, but from an operating model perspective, if you get to a point, for example, where you might think, well, I always plan to insource that, but actually it's going to be more cost effective now to outsource that, you know, you, you can be flexible from that perspective is, is there anything else that a leader could do if they sort of woke up one day and realised actually this op model is not working? I've always revised strategy, uh, strategies and operating models on, a, on an ongoing basis and I think you've got to be very cognisant of what's happening within your business and, you know, understanding what the business is doing, whether it's changing direction, whether it's M&A, whether it's a new product launch, et cetera, those things can all have an impact on the, mm. the operating model and how effective it can be. And I think it's really important to look at the operating model as guidance on how you're actually going to achieve your strategy or how you're going to meet the metrics for the board um, and looking at how you break that down over time to make sure that you're taking a phased approach towards your maturity targets. Ideally, it's the operating model that's going to help drive any organisation to the level of maturity that it wants. So I think, you know, it's changeable. There's always iterations of the model over time. I think you've got to do it so that there's always room for change or tweaking. And I don't think you should be directly attributing any of those changes to um, people and, and roles. Uh, it's not about um, uh, impacting all structures themselves. It's about having a look at the functions you need to deliver security to the, to the business and the capabilities you need under those functions to do so. And so often when you write a strategy, you build in metrics to make sure you can measure if the strategy was a success. But how do you measure if an operating model has been successful? Tricky question. Uh, Ideally, I think it's through maturity. So I think um, I mentioned that just before around that uh, phased approach to maturity. Your operating model can have that phased approach to deliver that outcome. So whether it's ISO, NIST, C2M2 or something else, depending on what the model is, you know, potentially through reductions in risk or vulnerabilities even. And I think the question you ask could perhaps be reshaped and, and made to be about measuring the success of the strategy through the op model. And so the operating model is just a mechanism to get there and to continue to deliver security outcomes. And I think it's beneficial perhaps to look at some of the issues or the failures to deliver or perhaps even failures to start uh, around the operating model. That might indicate it's not quite right and, and where it can be tweaked. 
but as a, an evolving platform or one that's agile, when the org changes or the security changes or the threat landscape changes, perhaps measuring it on its own isn't as meaningful as having a look at how well it's helping you deliver your strategic outcomes, a program of work or your vision or a plan. And I think the success of the Model 2 would be picked up in your team communications, your cross-functional relationships, whether or not you've been able to avoid team silos. I think even though, you know, security teams work well together in general, they are also teams that can become quite siloed with regards to the capabilities that they're delivering, just like any other team. So it, a good operating model breaks down those barriers, has those cross-functional processes. And I think another way would be our, uh, measuring engagement with the business and how well security is delivering business-driven outcomes or helping the business to achieve its outcomes rather than preventing them from doing business. Efficiencies and effectiveness within security could also be other measures that are utilised to have a look at whether or not the, the operating model is working effectively. Given all of that and that an operating model is needed in order for a strategy to be delivered effectively and efficiently and within budget of both finance and resources, do you think that it's better for a CISO to outsource the creation of the operating model or do you think they're better off at having a go at creating that operating model themselves? I think there's pros and cons on both sides. So uh, having created them myself with the assistance of others within my team, um, it's helped greatly with engagement. So being able to have that have the team come in, spend a couple of days locked away, which you couldn't really do now, you'd be locked away virtually, um, to, <laughs> to build out what could be a really good operating model. Um, I have found that an invaluable exercise in engagement. That said, I've also had advisors on the side who have been able to have a look at that and let me know of any pitfalls or challenges that they, they may see. So give me a, a little bit of guidance. I think the benefit of a third party doing some of the heavy lifting for you is there's a level of, and if you're looking for it, a level of credibility associated with having someone from outside the organisation who's not a party to culture who's not had uh, any kind of um, relationships yet within the organisation or perhaps just is on the sidelines of any of the politicking that can go on within organisations, it may actually bring a little bit of clout to what's being designed and developed that would help a CISO come and say, those ideas I've previously had here's what an independent third party is saying, let's do something about this. So I guess from a, a way of helping a CISO to um, have that a little bit more ability to influence utilising the opinion of a third party, it could be quite uh, valuable to get someone to, to have a look at uh, or design your operating model. What I think is hard in that though is making sure that all the context that could possibly um, be devolved to the third party is given. So uh, designing an op model when you're not part of an organisation can be a challenge if you don't have a strategy that you can get across with your client and therefore anchor to. Um, if you're not aware of some of the challenges that the organisation is facing into, whether it be um, from business perspective or a security perspective, regulatory or budgetary. So I think there's a lot of information that needs to be imparted and a lot of toing and froing to get the lay of the land and, and understand what's happening within an organisation to then go ahead and develop an op model. That said, that third party won't have a lot of the noise that can impact a CISO's perspective or even the team's perspective when they're developing their own. So I guess you, you've got to weigh up which way you want to come at it from because removing that noise can be quite beneficial. So can having an independent person of authority make some commentary around what your operating model should look like, but ensuring that you've given all the appropriate data points to them is going to determine whether or not that operating model development is a success. And I think, you know, providing your CISO that 
um, has that gravitas and that ability to influence and has the well-founded relationships within the organisation and you've already built an operating model and you're tweaking it over time, well, I, I don't really think there's a need for an independent third party to come and help you with that. Uh, or if you're still in the throes of working out what kind of security organisation your organisation needs and at the moment you're just looking at a list of tasks to respond to audit gaps or a, a list of tasks just to be doing the right things to try and close off those gaps associated with, you know, threats, for example, you, you may not be ready from a maturity point of view to be looking at an operating model yet anyway. So, I think you've got to weigh up a few of those things and, and figure out which way is the best way for you. I think there's heaps of different scenarios there as well where you might have a new CISO who's come into an organisation and they don't have the context either. So having a third party to support them is kind of no different to them doing it themselves other than the fact that they're trying to get up to speed mm-hmm. with a new organisation and you know potentially with a new strategy that might have been written before their time. So you know, having that third party do it for them can just take the burden, I suppose, off off a new CISO or off a CISO who's uh, completely snowed under. To have that third party do that piece of work for them can, I guess, be a just a bit of a respite yeah. <laughs> as well. Yeah, absolutely. Sam, thanks so much for coming back on the podcast. It's been really great to chat to you about something even more niche than we spoke about um, back in season one. And so for listeners who want to hear Sam's first time as a guest on The Secure CIO when she spoke about building teams. You can head back in the library of podcasts wherever you listen to your podcast and hear Sam talk about it and we'll put it in the show notes as well. So thanks, Sam. It's been great to have you back. Thanks, Claire. Thanks so much for joining me for today's episode. Feel free to listen to some of the previous guests on your favourite podcast app. For more information on all our guests, check out the show notes at thesecurecio.com, where you can also find more information on the Secure CIO framework, grab free chapters of my book, and sign up for my newsletter. If you love the show, please subscribe to the podcast and feel free to leave me a five-star rating. I'll see you next week. Mm-hmm.